Port Adelaide. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and it's um, an absolute pleasure to rise in support of this bill. As a long-time supporter of marriage equality, as someone who voted uh, in favour of the, I'll call it the Jones Bill in 2012, uh, it is wonderful to be on the, on really on the point of this reform becoming a reality finally in Australia. Uh, this is an important uh, reform in terms of civil rights, and uh, and. Um, it's important to bear in mind, as the member for Kurangamite has, has um, beautifully outlined, I think, that any advance in civil rights is not an abstract piece of paper. It's a panoply of very human stories, as we've just heard. Uh, and um, before the 2012 vote, uh, members who were here were encouraged to go and have a conversation with their community about uh, the attitude that should be taken to the private members' bill that was before the parliament then, that, as I said, I supported at the time. And when I spoke in favour of that bill in 2012, I read out an email that um, is still moving to me from a grandmother in the Port Adelaide electorate. And she wrote to me before the debate in the parliament and said, and I quote uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, when my grandchildren ask me why I can love my partner and not be married, it's painful to explain that I live in a country that does not let people like me get married. After 33 years, three children and two grandchildren, I think I can attest to love, commitment and the hard slog of long-term relationship that goes side by side with the beautiful family moments. And on the day before the vote back in 2012, more than five years ago, uh, Molly in my electorate emailed me and she said, as with so many families, we cannot wait to celebrate at our beautiful daughter's wedding ceremony. With votes such as yours, it's getting closer and closer. Unfortunately, Molly, her family, so many families around Australia have had to wait more than five years since that last vote that we had in 2012. But we are, it would appear, Mr Deputy Speaker, finally here at a point where within 24 hours this parliament will have passed this reform, I very much hope. And this is, um, as a number of speakers have pointed out, just really the latest chapter in a series of legal and social reforms around homosexuality that have occurred over the last five decades. And in each of those chapters, I'm so proud that the Labor Party has played a leading role. Going back to the decision of the South Australian Premier from my state, Don Dunstan, 45 years ago, to enact the first piece of legislation to decriminalise homosexuality to the legislation that the first Rudd government put in place to remove discrimination from dozens and dozens of pieces of Commonwealth legislation against same-sex couples. Labor has played a leading role. Uh, and this chapter, as, as almost all of them have been, certainly the significant chapters have been, has been a long and hard road. Most obviously, it goes without saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, for LGBTIQ Australians and for their families. Uh, and for, like so many uh, of those very important social reforms that we've seen over the decades in Australia, the Labor Party's journey in this question has both reflected but also helped to lead the change in opinion that we've seen over recent years in the broader Australian community. But in saying that, as a Labor Party person, obviously I focus on the role of the Labor Party. In saying that, I think it's important that we also recognise that it was a very long, hard road within the Labor Party. I know, uh, as a long-time activist in the Labor Party, involved in these debates, that for many in the community, for some in the chamber, I imagine, today, um, that was too slow. We were too slow. I know that there were points along the way in that journey where we broke the hearts of many people who wanted and expected the Labor Party to be braver and to be quicker than we were. Uh, I remember um, having to report back on negotiations, for example, at the 2009 National Conference, negotiations that the member for Grainler and I had been involved in around these questions, to a room of very, very angry National Conference delegates, Rainbow Labor members. There was a lot of anger and there were a lot of tears. And I think we need to be honest as a Labor Party about that. The negotiations that I was a part of in the 2011 National Conference, uh, they were hard too. But in those intervening two years, there had been a substantial shift, both in the broader community but also in the Labor Party. 
and the adoption of marriage equality as a Labor Party policy at the 2011 National Conference was a huge achievement. It was an achievement for leaders like Penny Wong, but importantly an achievement for hundreds and hundreds of party members, particularly members of Rainbow Labor, who had been working so hard within the party to make that change. Uh, and it profoundly shifted the national debate. That decision at the conference in 2011 profoundly shifted the national debate. For me, Deputy Speaker, I've always been clear what the legal position should be for same-sex couples on this question. It should be civil marriage as of right, as of legal inalienable right, and it should be religious marriage with choice for religious institutions. In the lead-in to the National Conference in 2011, I wrote as much in an op-ed published in the Sydney Morning Herald, where I said that Australia should adopt the model that had just recently then been adopted by the New York State and also by the United Kingdom, where there was a legal inalienable right to civil marriage for same-sex couples, but the right of churches and other religious institutions to choose not to conduct same-sex marriage ceremonies if that was their preference. Uh, and I see that position broadly uh, adopted in this bill, which is a very significant reason why I support it. The key work, though, other than that carve-out, the key work of this bill is to provide that legal, inalienable right to civil marriage. And in doing that, we should be honest that marriage in Australia today is overwhelmingly a civil institution, and that is a relatively recent phenomenon. When I became an adult in the late 1980s, 60 per cent of marriage ceremonies were conducted by religious celebrants. 60 per cent were religious ceremonies. In 1999, the majority shifted to civil ceremonies. And since then, there has been a precipitous drop in market share, if you like, Deputy Speaker, by religious celebrants or religious ceremonies. When I wrote that op-ed just in 2011, only six years ago, um, religious ceremonies still then accounted for about one-third of all marriage ceremonies in Australia, about 33 per cent. In Queensland and in WA, by then it had already dropped to less than 30 per cent. But I looked at the ABS data, Deputy Speaker, on marriages and divorces that, that was only released last week for 2016, and the market share of religious ceremonies is down to 23.6 per cent of all marriages in Australia. In WA and Queensland, religious ceremonies now account for less than 20 per cent of marriages conducted in those two states. And in what is now a predominantly civil institution, the institution of marriage, it is only proper that civil standards of equality before the law are applied by this parliament. I've always supported, as I've said, the right for religious institutions, for churches, effectively to opt out of conducting same-sex ceremonies. But I do not support any of the other amendments that have been proposed, either by the member for Warringa or have been foreshadowed by other members of the Conservatives. And I have to say, Deputy Speaker, that I am somewhat struck by the irony of the big C Conservatives on the other side of this House uh, now arguing to enshrine such rights in law. My first campaign in politics was the 1988 referendum, where the Labor government proposed to extend freedom of religion in this country, the 1988 referendum. And I remember John Howard at the time engaged in a vigorous and, I think, cynical campaign because his political fortunes were not going particularly well, led then by the new member for Flinders, Peter Reith, to knock that campaign off. And as a result, we did not extend the right or freedom of religion because of a decision in a campaign led by John Howard, reflecting the decision that the equivalent parties took in 1944 in the post-war reconstruction and democratic rights referendum of that year as well. Um, so I think it is somewhat ironic that you've got the big C Conservatives on that side of the parliament now deciding that they do support enshrining rights such as the freedom of religion into legislation or the constitution, because as I think the newly engaged member for Goldstein has pointed out, that has not been the traditional position of those opposite, as I found in the first campaign that I was involved in as a relatively young Labor activist in the late 1980s. But as the Leader of the Opposition has said on behalf of Labor, we support the Ruddock panel process. Importantly, it includes, I think, Frank Brennan, a great Australian, 
uh, who pointed to the 1988 referendum and the failure of, uh, of there to be a bipartisan level of support given to the extension of the freedom of religion as being, in, in, in Mr Brennan's words, a, a lost opportunity. And I think there is some irony in this. Um, it is also important to say, I think, that I didn't support the plebiscite. I didn't support the postal survey for a range of reasons. Uh, only one of them uh, was the, the extraordinary cost involved. As a matter of principle, I just do not support the idea of submitting questions of civil rights for groups in our community to a plebiscite of the entire community. I think as a matter of principle, it is, it is the wrong way for this parliament to work. But I think also as a practical, uh, as a, as a practical question, what we warned would happen obviously did happen. There was enormous division, there was enormous hurt caused by this plebiscite and postal survey. Although I think what we're about to do in the next 24 hours is a wonderful thing, that should not be taken as any sort of endorsement of the process that's been followed over the last couple of months. But I do say, having said that, Mr Deputy Speaker, passage of this bill will be a great moment for our nation. And it's a moment that should be the cause of substantial pride for a lot of people who have worked so hard for many, many years, or in the case of some young activists, very, very hard for a relatively short period of time. All of that work has just been utterly wonderful. I want to thank uh, LGBTIQ Australians for their patience and for their forbearance, not just through the recent process, but for the years and years that we have been arguing for this important reform. I want to thank Rainbow families across Australia for their forbearance over that entire period of time. I particularly want to thank the Rainbow family I'm closest to, my old friend, my dear friend Penny, uh, Sophie, Alexandra and Hannah, who have had the spotlight put on their family like no other, and I think they've shown enormous dignity through this process as a symbol for so many thousands and thousands of Rainbow families across the country. I've talked about the role of Rainbow Labor within our particular political party. I just think they've been fantastic, and I think the work they did to change our party's position and lead the change in the broader community has been utterly wonderful. A range of other organisations have been equally wonderful, AME, PFLAG, uh, uh, the Yes campaign and many, many others. It is um, very risky to shout out individuals uh, in this sort of long-term reform, but I'm going to do it anyway, Mr Deputy Speaker. Rodney Croom has already been mentioned. I know he's been in the gallery during parts of this debate. Uh, Rodney's um, courage, his resolve, uh, has been an inspiration to me and to many others in this chamber and around Australia for many, many years. Uh, and with his perhaps relatively recent um, sidekick, Shelley Argent, who I do still see in the chamber, stomping the halls of this parliament, making the case relentlessly to parliamentarians, uh, their work has been an utter inspiration. To all of the volunteers who worked so hard on this campaign, um, you just did a great thing for our country. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the honour.